Okay, so today I want to talk to you about what is the best diet for an adrenal slash HPA axis problem. So are you ready for the drum roll? Because everyone is looking for that secret diet, that secret combination, like the, the padlock, and you're just one or two numbers away. So the drum roll for the secret diet for those that are dealing with, well, let's talk about first, you're dealing with, you're dealing with fatigue. You're dealing with exhaustion. You're dealing with brain fog. You're not handling your stress very well, which means you can't focus or you get anxious or you get even panic attacks, difficulty breathing, heart pounding, butterflies in the stomach, crashing in the middle of the day, not having a good circadian rhythm when you first wake up ready to take on the day, not hitting the pillow and sleeping like a baby and just not doing well. So what's the best diet for that? And the drum roll is, there is no one best diet, sorry. But I will tell you if there is one thing that you are doing wrong and you have all of the above, you have fatigue, exhaustion, immune system challenges, um, difficulty exercising, not having energy, can't get through the day, relying on coffee and stimulants, um, just not doing well. One thing I will say is nutritional deficiencies nutritional deficiencies. It really, really makes me mad. I know this is going to be a controversial subject, but with the coronavirus, we're seeing people get take down, taken down and having major challenges with their health and or they're dying. And not that it's not a, a very contagious illness. If you have a strong immune system, you won't succumb to the viral problem. And in order for you to have a strong immune system, you can't have nutritional deficiencies. So if you were to ask me what the best diet for adrenal HPA axis dysfunction is, it's the one that provides you sufficient amount of nutrients so that you replenish your nutritional deficiencies. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about how to achieve that. Is it a paleo diet, is it a keto diet, is it a low FODMAT diet, is it an AI diet, is it a histamine diet, which diet? And again, I'm not going to say that there's one best diet for anyone, but I'll give you these concepts. Number one, you have to have the right carbs. Carbs are not essential. You don't have essential fatty acids, essential proteins, amino acids, essential carbohydrates. Carbs, carbs are not essential, but I'll say they are very, very important for someone that doesn't have energy. Number two, the right proteins. We'll talk about the right proteins. Number three, we'll talk about the right fats. Number four, we'll talk about meal timing. And I mean a couple things by that. And then last, I'll say, talk to you about tests, supplements, and ways to recover in stressful times when you're dealing with burnout, exhaustion, and most importantly, not being validated, looking for answers, knowing that there's something deeper going on in your body and you don't accept the fact that it's just, um, it's just low vitamin D or you have a blood glucose problem or you have maybe a little bit high cholesterol or fill in the blank. Um, that's not answering the questions. And I know a lot of you, I talk to you and you're looking for solutions. You're looking for putting the, connecting all the dots. Like there's gotta be a relationship between when I was 16 and I had anxiety and then I had all the stressors in my life and then I had to take medication and fill, all of those are connected. And, and again, what I would tell you is nutritional deficiencies. If that were the silver bullet, and you could eat a meal that looked like some something your grandma or your great grandmother would recognize, chances are even with that great quality of food, it's probably nutrient deficient because our soils are so depleted in minerals, we don't get the optimal minerals and stress uses up a lot of energy. If I have nervous energy, there's a reason for that term, nervous energy. I'm in that sympathetic fight or flight. I gotta make neurotransmitters. I'm making adrenaline. I'm making epinephrine. I gotta clear those out and I gotta support my glucose metabolism. I gotta get fuel to the cells. I gotta get ATP. I gotta breathe. I gotta get oxygen. There's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes that if you don't have the micronutrients, those minerals to power those enzymatic reactions, you're gonna bunk. You are. And if you're eating food that's processed 
or it comes out of a, um, a, a vending machine or from a takeout window, especially in today's day and age. I mean, I'm seeing people removing their masks to open their window to get their McDonald's meal because they're being safe. Yet that is the reason why they need to wear the mask. And from my point of view, they're wearing the mask more so that they don't infect and give contagions to other people that potentially are healthy. Because these people that are at the takeout window covering their mouth are getting it all backwards. They are devoided of micronutrients that are going to help fuel their immune system. And, and that means looking like a, getting a meal that looks like your mother, your grandmother, your great grandmother recognize. And it's not out of a takeout window. It's not out of a vending machine. It's hopefully not packaged so that you have more than three or five ingredients in there. Um, I've said this a long time ago where the actual ingredient that should be in your food is food. That should be the ingredient. So anyways, um, let's talk about the right, right carbohydrates. So this is very, very important because I work with a lot of people and, and I really don't put as much emphasis on the dietary percentages as much as I used to um, because A, it's very limiting. I know that when you guys are very, very, um, let's say, you follow the rules and, and you're very strict and, and you have a lot of discipline and you're removing these foods, but you're not getting better. Um, what I find is you're not replacing the things that you're removing. So for example, when, we, we, when we're eating the right carbs, a lot of the times we'll just remove gluten, right? And, and while gluten I feel is the devil with horns and a, and a spiked fork, um, it, it, the problem with gluten being removed is you remove a lot of the B vitamins that were there. You remove a lot of the prebiotic support that were there and the fiber and, and the things that slow down your, um, your spiking of your glucose and support the production of your microbiome. So when I say right carbs, I mean that when you remove the grains, you're replacing it with fiber whether that be root vegetables like beets and turnips and, um, and, and parsnips. And there's so many things that you can put in there, carrots. Um, you can put uh, a lot of different root vegetables, sweet potatoes. A lot of those root vegetables will provide a great amount of fiber and pre-fiber so that you have a nice microbiome. And, and the goal for someone that's depleted is to get them energy. And a lot of the times we'll talk about fats where you may not be an ideal fat burner if you're burnt out and you're exhausted and you have no energy. Fat is a very slow fuel. It's like a log, dense log that takes a long time to burn. And if you're needing energy right away, you're going to need the right carbs. And we're not talking about sugary, refined sugars, types of stuff like that. We're talking about the right fibers like root vegetables that can really make a huge difference in your diet. And I think it should be there with each and every meal. Um, I do think that there are some testing that you can do to check to see if you're getting some cross reactive to the newly introduced grains like oatmeal, quinoa, amaranth, tapioca, um, those hemp, those types of things may be doing you wrong because you have avoided gluten, but you're eating some of the carbs that are stimulating an immune response. So again, the best diet for that person is going to be the diet that, does, that has carbs that are providing fiber, that are providing B vitamins, that are providing the nice microbiome mule of, uh, of what you want to make in your gut so that you have a nice B factory. But if you're reacting to some of those potential um, uh, proteins, then you're stimulating an immune response. So that takes a little bit of time and maybe testing, um, but the concepts are there. I think that you need to, everyone needs to get off of gluten um, because of the Roundup, because of the GMOs, because of the sprays. Um, and, and I think that you can go on some of those other fiber-based grains, but you have to be careful if you haven't done a, a genetic test, which I think is key. Everyone should do the genetic testing. 
Um, number two is the right protein. So I mean a couple things by this. There are essential amino acids. So if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, you're probably pretty sophisticated in knowing that you need to get those essential amino acids that your body can't produce on its own. And a lot of the time that means combining your lentils with your legumes um, and other plant-based um, sources of protein um, so that you're getting that um, that healthy array of essentials. But I mean more than anything, are you getting digestive support? Because ultimately when you're burnt out and your immune system is depleted and your adrenals and your HPA axis isn't firing optimally, um, what happens is your, your body is starved um, for the proper nutrients. And, and if you don't have proper digestive support, you're going to have that protein. It's going to sit there and it's going to ferment. And then it's going to create some reflux. And then the doctors are going to put you on a proton pump inhibitor like omeprazole or something like that. And while that uh, uh, epigastric reflux of, of lactic acid fermenting going up in your esophagus and burning you is burning you. It's not because you have too much hydrochloric acid. You have too little hydrochloric acid. That food is sitting there and it's rotting, it's fermenting, it's overloading your liver, it's creating an intestinal permeability, it's creating an immune response, you're developing food sensitivities, and you're eating too much protein with not enough digestive support. So again, deviating from a little bit of what you thought I was gonna be talking about, the best adrenal diet or the best diet to support your HPA axis is going to give you the proteins that aren't going to over, overwork your GI system so that you have the digestive support. I like apple cider vinegar, um, betaine hydrochloric acid, pepsin. Those are all amazing things. And if you're on a proton pump inhibitor, I wouldn't tell you to just go off of it right away. What I would do is I would say, well, number one, I wouldn't tell you to go off of it at all. I'm not your doctor. Um, but even if I were your doctor, I would tell you that we need to pass the baton, not while you're standing flat footed. And so let's introduce a little bit of betaine with each meal and see if that doesn't cause a reduction or does cause a reduction of, of that epigenetic gastric pain and all of a sudden a light bulb goes on and tells you that you have problems with breaking down that protein and that's adding to your digestive woes. The other thing I would say about the right proteins is there's a lot of mixed, mixed opinions on how much you should be eating. Um, I've seen 0.8 kilograms, uh, 0.8 grams per kilogram, um, which would, you know, if your kilograms are less than two, um, they're less than half your, your body weight. Um, that's going to be kind of low. Um, I've also seen 0.5 or uh, 0.55 grams per pound of body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, um, you're going to do 0.5 of that or a little more, so 100. So somewhere about half your body weight in grams is somewhere good but as long as you have that digestive support. Now, I myself am going more and more uh, vegan as we go. I don't eat a lot of meat but I still get enough of, the, of those proteins with digestive support so that that can stabilize my glucose. The other thing I wanna to talk to you is about the right fat. So I get this question all the time, is the ketogenic diet perfect or good for someone that has adrenal fatigue? And I said, it really depends. I had adrenal fatigue and when I did a genetic test on myself, I realized that I am not good at burning fat from a genetic predisposition point of view. That means my ACAT enzyme, my PANK enzyme, my PEMT enzyme, my FADS enzyme, my SLC enzymes, they suck. They suck. I'm not good at it. And so um, I need support again. That's why I have their digestive support. L-carnitine is very, very good for me. And pantothene is very, very good for me. If, if those are things that you may have challenges with too, I, I urge you to look into L-carnitine and to pantothene. Um, but the right fats, that means that um, you are getting a, enough fats because fats are not the boogeyman. I've said that so many times before where fats 
need are needed for hormone production. And despite what the doctors tell you, um, it's not good to have very low cholesterol, lower than 150. A lot of doctors are even saying there's um, there's studies that show over 200 um, have a higher intelligence than those that are lower than 200. Because you think about it, your brain is one big fatty tissue and it needs cholesterol, it needs fat. And that doesn't mean you go and get your deep fried foods uh, or you eat a lot of um, food that are hydrogenated in, in trans fats amazing that they're even around anymore um, but don't go and eat terrible types of fats you want to eat healthy fats like eggs and uh, chia seeds and looking at nuts and seeds and healthy oils and by the way even if it's organic organic vegetable oil is not good oil unless you want to clean your wood and give it a nice shine that's a good oil um, so the right fats now, high percentage, low percentage, I would tell you, I would need to do a genetic test on you. Um, and I would also want to do an organic acid test on you because the organic acid test does show me your ketone metabolites where you may not be fat adapted yet. You're not burning and combusting that fuel. And that's because you have nutritional deficiencies. You have an adrenal based HPA axis problem. Your cells aren't producing ATP effectively. You're not producing methyl groups optimally. You're not producing L-carnitine enough. That L-carnitine is not burning your healthy fats on the organic acid test, it tells me that it's coming out. And I'm asking you, are you eating in a keto based diet? And you say yes. And I'm saying, it's not good for you. And let me ask you, are you testing your glucose and ketones? And they say no, I'm like, you know what, then don't tell me in six months from now that you tried keto and it didn't work because you didn't do your homework. You didn't do it properly. You didn't investigate your pre um, in, preconditions um, or the realities of your body. You didn't, how many did you eat on a daily basis? How many grams? How many grams of protein? How, this is not to dip your toe in the water and just play around. This is for getting serious and looking at biomarkers and seeing how those biomarkers are changing so that you know that that diet didn't work for you. But don't tell me you didn't take your glucose, you didn't take your ketones, you didn't do a genetic test, you didn't look at your before and after in terms of your blood work, and you didn't make other inferences because then I'm not going to believe you whether it worked or not. The fourth thing I'm going to tell you is meal timing. So when I say meal timing, I do wholly believe that the best diet for an adrenal-based problem is not small meals more frequently. I really don't believe that. I think we're turning that on its head nowadays. Now, if you're an exhausted, not producing cortisol whatsoever, um, then I would say potentially small meals more frequently. But I would still say meal timing is key, meaning I don't want you eating past seven or eight at night. I don't want you eating before seven or eight in the morning. You need a 12 hour window. There's no reason you can't have a 12 hour window. You need to have a 12 hour window or longer. So meaning if your last meal was at seven, your next meal the next day is seven or maybe eight or maybe nine. Um, and that would be a 12, 13, 14 hour window where your body is resetting its circadian rhythm. It's getting in tune with when it gets dark out, when it gets light out, it's resetting your HPA axis. You're not putting in visual or, or, or physical cues that tell your body that it's a different time than what it thinks it is based on the light and darkness. You're telling it based on a resetting of that clock every time you feed it. So I don't accept just because you have an adrenal based hypoglycemic problem that you need to eat every few hours. There's first of all that meal timing that you can do. The other thing I would say that people don't look at in terms of timing is what are you doing when you're eating? What are you doing when you're eating? Are you driving? I've done that before. I'm talking to you, Joel. When you're driving, you're eating. What's that? Uh, are you are you on the phone? Are you looking at your internet? Um, you know, if you've had a pet and, and you go and distract that pet when it's eating, it's not happy. It just wants to be left alone. It's your parasympathetic time. 
you have enough sympathetic time with the stressors of life, with your demands, with your relationship, with your finances, with your work, with your family. You have enough stress. You need to get out of sympathetic into parasympathetic, and that is rest and digest, and that's eating. That's your vagus nerve. That's the things that you do when you're not running from a tiger and, and, and shunting all the muscles full of blood and, and oxygen and, and energy. You're putting it back into your GI system to break foods down. That means both feet on the table, maybe you're outside, maybe you're in a pleasant conversation, but you're not frantic looking at your emails, getting all the things. And I know you're laughing because I know you do that. Um, so make sure that um, you do that. And then as far as tests go, the first thing that I would say is everyone needs to get a functional genomic test. It, it just goes without saying that hopefully in the future, everyone will have one so that they can customize a recovery program and a best diet strategy based on their genetic predisposition. So some things that I see are some of the enzymes in the acetylation and fats and, and proteins and carbs um, that don't allow those nutrients to get into Krebs cycle and be used effectively. And I see that all the time, but you need an organic acid test potentially. Could you do a nutritional deficiency test? Yeah, I don't do it very often. I just assume you are. But if you want to see the black and white, we can do a spectra cell nutritional deficiency test to show you that you are nutrient deficient. Basic blood work. And I really don't mean basic because most of the time I get them, but it's less than basic. I don't see vitamin D. I don't see ferritin. I don't see homocysteine. Um, and then I don't see more important things like um, ceruloplasm, G6PD, um, those are some of the things that I really like to see on, on the tests. Um, organic acid testing, very key to see if we're burning the, the right fuels based on your diet, looking at your microbials. Do you have any um, heavy metals? Those are things that could really block up your utilization. Like for example, if someone has a heavy metal toxicity and they have a B vitamin or MTR, MTRR problem, they're not utilizing their B12 and they're a vegan or they've done a gastric bypass surgery, that could be a perfect storm brewing right there. And I would wanna let them know, hey, listen, I get that you wanna be a vegan, but it's hard enough as it is with someone that has these genetic challenges, these epigenetic realities like heavy metals and or gastric bypass surgery. Now you're throwing on a diet in there, which doesn't have a lot of B, uh, vitamin B12, and that's essential for ser serotonin production, glutathione production, it's essential. Um, so maybe we can talk and customize a program around your wants and your beliefs and your realities, your physical reality. So hopefully that made sense. The best diet for an adrenal-based problem, number one, is one that replenishes nutritional deficiencies. Um, it has the right breakdown of carbohydrates that are going to replenish the, the fiber, the prebiotic support, the postbiotic support, the probiotic support the B vitamins that you're removing when you remove your grains and looking at root-based vegetables, right proteins in terms of the essential aminos, um, making sure that you have a digestive support and you're not eating too much. I didn't mention that. A lot of the times if we eat too much protein, that can be very gluconeogenic and that's going to cause a spike of your insulin. It's going to cause a spike of your inflammation, a spike of your growth factors and a spike of your fatigue. The right fats, very important to do the genetic testing, making sure you can get some digestive support like bile support if you don't have a gallbladder anymore. Um, beet roots can be very helpful for that as well. Um, lipases, um, dandelion root, phosphatidylcholine, lots of stuff you can do for that. Meal timing is really key, um, not just the 12 hour window or 13 hour window, but sitting in an environment where you're resting and digesting, not on your phone, and then the proper test to support that. So hopefully that made a lot of sense to you. My name is Dr. Joel Rosen. I am the Adrenal Fatigue Recovery Ninja, and I look forward to ending your adrenal fatigue nightmare. Take care.